Welcome to Hispanic Biz Success Stories. I'm Omero Galicia. We have the pleasure of talking with successful entrepreneurs who built wonderful businesses to learn from them their story about their challenges and their victories. We find these stories fascinating. Every business has a story. Thank you for joining us. Today we have a very special guest with us, Mr. Abraham Quinones, who owns a company called Quality Supply. Mr. Quinones, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me, Omero. Mr. Quinones, what is Quality Supply? Quality Supply is an industrial distributor. Somos proveedores de maquila. We, um, we basically find the right solution for the customer. Um, uh, we help them sometimes transfer a production line from Europe, uh, expand their current operations, or even just redesign a, an old workstation. Uh, they know that they can count on us for anything that they need. Our team is just the best team, the best technical uh, experienced guys, and the people that know us, they know that we're, gonna, we're not gonna let them down. So we, we do have a focus, and that it's quality control products. Quality control products. What are quality control products? Now, quality control products, it's everything that will tell them if their product is good or not good. So either they accept it or reject it. And I'm talking about dimensions. When they produce something, um, the end product has to have certain specifications. So we, we go there, we analyze the application, and we recommend under a uh, big umbrella of products that we represent. These are well-known brand, American brands and some European and Japanese. And we, we even have a, a showroom in our offices where they can go and try the, our equipment before they can buy it. It's this uh, microscopes, video systems, vision systems, gauges, uh, micrometers, things like that. I know you brought a piece with you. Do you mind telling us what that is? Yes, yes. So what we have here, it's, um, it's an optical and a digital microscope. This part is like the old microscope they used to uh, see at uh, the high school. This part is the interesting part. See, I have a penny here. I don't know if you can see it. That um, does the Abraham Lincoln Monument in Washington. But I don't know if you knew, but there's Abraham Lincoln sitting there, right oh, really? there in the middle. I've never seen that. Right there, we're looking at 6x. That means it's six times larger than real. And this is gonna be 20 times. Once you get it in focus, I don't know if you can see it right there in the middle. Oh, okay. There he is. So it does show Lincoln. Yeah. That's a penny. That's a penny. Wow. <coughs> Nobody knows it's there. <laughs> and so how do they use that in manufacturing? Well, they inspect let's say electrical boards, mechanic, uh, medical, even medical instruments, they get inspected on this equipment. They sometimes they, they glue a medical part to another medical uh, uh, component. And this is, these are components that go into the heart, like stents. Um, these are for medical companies. They have hundreds of these on the production line. And the operator is looking at that screen, deciding if it's good or not good, or just sometimes making a, uh, a rework or a process. Wow, fascinating. <clears throat> How in the world did you get into this business? Oof, um, I, I always had a, an entrepreneurship style since I was a kid. Um, I remember in elementary, I will make drawings and sell it to my classmates for a peso. They'll buy it. I don't know how, why. <laughs> and all through my life, I've always been uh, very curious. I want to know everything. And the maquiladora is it's a very interesting world. So when I get out of college, I work for several companies, so I learned something about that. But it was, it was, it was more the, the opportunity 
that I was looking uh, for me and my family. Uh, you know, this is the country of opportunity, so I wanted to try for myself and had some contacts in some maquilas and some friends, and uh, so I, uh, I risked it all to try it, and it, it worked great. Do you have a technology background? No, I don't, actually. No, I'm, uh, I'm an accountant. <laughs> You're an accountant. <laughs> and where'd you go to school? UTEP. Did. And your high school, where'd you do your high school? Well, high school, um, I was born and raised in Juarez. So, as you can tell, I'm not an English speaker. I'm not uh, very well fluent in, in English. I, I'm still learning. So I grew up in Juarez. I went to school. Uh, I'm from La Gilotepec, as like they say. Some people make fun of me because of that. Um, I um, went to Bachiller Siete. Then I later moved to El Paso to live with roommates when I was going to UTEP. Um, but it was a challenge for me because of the language barrier that I had at that time. So you came, you started UTEP without knowing English? Uh, almost nothing. Really? Yeah, it was tough. Wow. <laughs> When you, when you, there's a program, there's an ESL program for international students. I was an international student under an F1 visa. So when you come here, they have, uh, they give you two years of, there's two years of basic classes in Spanish while you take your ESL classes. So instead of me finishing in four years, I finish in six and a half years. But it's tough because, you know, the, the culture's different. Even though there are two cities together, the customs and the culture's different, and, and it, it was a challenge for me. It is a challenge? It is a challenge, see. Uh, at that time, I mean, because I'm an international student, so I didn't have, I couldn't apply for financial aid. So my dad had to pay cash, full price. So, I mean, this is 20 years ago, it wasn't as expensive as, it is today, but I started working, when you're an international student, they let you work at school. And the only place they will hire Mexicans, it's in the food service. It's, 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 cause it's tough, you know? Nobody would wanna work there. So I was, I was doing pizzas, and then my class, I had to rush over class, take out my apron, all smelly, and then you have a two, three hour with no class, so you go back and you will serve your classmates and your professors oh. <laughs> right there. So I had to work to pay for my, you know, my living expenses because at that time my family moved to, to Denver. So I had to stay by myself. So this is a guy, uh, 19, 20 years old, moved to El Paso, lived with strangers, cultures different. So it was tough. See, uh, I started working on that food service and we opened these new Quiznos. I think it was a first Quiznos back then. So I didn't know much. I mean, it, I was pretty young, 19, 20. So something weird happened. Uh, Natalicio, the president of Utah, which has recently passed away, you know that. Um, she came over and, and this is funny, um, she ordered a, um, a blue cheese salad. And I thought, I mean, there's only one type of cheese the one that my mom puts on the quesadillas, right? So I have these all these 20 type of cheeses and this is the first day we opened. So I thought the cheese was part of Quiznos invention. So I, there was no blue cheese. So I took, I think it was Parmesan or Caesar. I put her in there she, and she, she was with somebody else, a visitor. She didn't say anything. They ate the food, they left. Next day, the manager calls me and says, hey, do you serve Natalicio and try to know if she's, oh my gosh, yes, but who will know? And then he explained to me. And I didn't know that. I mean, it's the barrier and the culture. The, I mean, and I came from Juarez. <laughs> 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 it's those little things like that. Yeah. I remember the first time they asked for um, uh, eggs with sausage. I couldn't pronounce sausage. And I was on the grill, okay? First, second semester, 5% of English. I couldn't, and I was taking the orders from everybody, you know, there's, there's people from all around the world and different accents, and, and it was as hard to me 
to blend in in the kitchen with the, no, the terminology of the kitchen in English, it's so hard, even as hard as the classes. So for me, it was adapting and you know, wow. going to school and then going to work. And most of the people that is international student, they know this, they, they all wow. work like that. Wow, interesting. And so what, uh, what, what did you study at UTEP? I was, I was first going to psych for psychology. And I changed my mind, and I went for business, and and then I, I really like numbers, so I, I I did accounting. So how that's a jump to go from accounting to starting a business. Yes, um, you know the I was going for business management, but I wanted something more specialized, and and. I I really love numbers. So when I when I went when I graduated, I always I always had this entrepreneurship in me. So I always was planning and planning to do something for myself. And I knew accounting was going to help, and it helped a lot. So that was in your mind all along. Uh, yeah. And your father? What does your father do? Well, my dad he's an electrical engineer. He graduated from uh, El Tecnológico de Juárez. He's from Durango, and my mom's from, Chi from a little town in Chihuahua called Namiquipa. She's a stay-at-home mom, but they were both great parents. Your father, what's his name? Jose Quiñones. And your mother? Uh, Leticia Muñoz. Good, and you're married? Yes, yes, um, the beautiful wife, beautiful, beautiful wife, Gladys Rodriguez. She made me say that. Hi, Gladys. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I had two, two boys, four and three, Isaac and Isai. Isaias? No, Isai. 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 Yeah. Okay. That's that's, so that's my wife's invention. <laughs> that's nice. I like that. <clears throat> yeah, I have a son named Isai. Yes. That's the correct one. But and, and we call him Isai. Uh-huh. Isai. But you have the extra eye. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's interesting. Good. And and uh, wh where did you meet your wife? Um, in Juarez, through friends. You know, That's yeah. just from after high school. So so after college, you start working outside of college. Yes, <coughs> I was looking a job in in um, for accounting, um, and then I started working, and I I I I was doing I was doing a little bit of everything. But I wasn't, I wasn't, I wanted more. I wanted to do something by myself. So after a few years working in, uh, in, in several companies, <coughs> I started a, um, like a side project. We, were, we had a recycling co uh, company really? on the weekends. So I was, I was working. And then on the weekends, uh, I was working on the recycling with, uh, with a partner, great partner. Um, but it didn't work for me. You know, we were doing a uh, waste yard and then trying to, trying to uh, process that into uh, wood chips and mulch and then uh, firewood, but we'd have no money, no, no funds. So one day I was there on a country club road trying to sell my, my wood bundles. Um, I didn't sell nothing because the winter already passed, so it was not the right timing. And I was reading this book and the f uh, there was a phrase that inspired me. And after reading that, I just closed the book, uh, then moved away from my partner and started my business in 30 days. What was the phrase? Um, it read, um, it's ne never going to be the right time. I was waiting, you know, waiting, and I uh, had to have this and that. But no, I was ready. I was always ready. It's just so what, what kind of work were you doing though during the week? Uh, I was doing um, sales, bookkeeping, office clerk, a little bit of everything. In what kind of industries? Uh, mostly we were selling to the uh, manufacturing industry in Mexico. So you knew about that already? Yes. Yes. And, and your father, what kind of engineering did he do? Electrical engineer. In, 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 uh, did he have his own business? or? or? No, no. Well, no, he was, he was laid off. In uh, I think around 2000, when the recession hit, he he spent in the maquiladoras about 
20 years, so that's, that's okay. how I know about it too. Okay. Um, so he, he, he came from humble beginnings in, uh, from Durango, from a little town, town in Durango. And then um, he, he went to school, got his degree, and then he started working his way up from worker, and then he ended up in a management position. I remember going to the Maquilas with him on, on Saturdays. Okay. I remember looking at the production, and it was, it was great. It was so you grew up with the maquila industry? Yes, yes. Everybody in Juarez grew up with the maquilas. Do you have brothers and sisters? Yes. Um, f not just four brothers. We're four boys. I guess my parents uh, stopped trying for yeah. the girl. <laughs> so uh, we're four, four boys. What do they all do, your brothers? Um, my, uh, the second, uh, my, my next brother, he, he, is, um, he has a PhD. Is teaching in um, in the state of Virginia uh, philosophy. Wow! Uh, my other brother, the first, uh, this is Omar, and then is Israel. He graduated from Boulder, and then the youngest one, Oliver, he's, he's getting into Boulder for physics. Okay. So, so how long have you been working before you decided it's time to start my business? About. Six years, not much. Did that prepare you enough? I think so. But I've been, I always had a healthy financial discipline. So I was getting prepared from even earlier. See, I remember when I was going to UTEP, I didn't have much money, right? So I had to take care of that. I remember that I was, I used to record every transaction every day on a spreadsheet just to make sure I'm not going over my budget. Your own expenses? My own expenses. I will go back at night before getting into bed, open up my computer, and then record every burrito and everything. One dollar will matter to me. Everything. I, I should have this fresh sheet somewhere. I, I think I kept it. And my friends used to make fun of me because of that, but I just wanted to have it under control. So I always had that mindset the counting mindset and the entrepreneurship mindset, even from before. Um, didn't prepare much, didn't have a lot of savings. So when I, when I decided to, to jump in, all I had was a credit card and no customers. I didn't remember in 30 days after reading that so book. So what kind of business did you start? Well, it, um, um, a uh, supplier for the maquila. Just I, like that? Just like that, I, I had some experience, but I didn't have a whole lot of money, I didn't have a line of credit, I didn't have much. So at that time, because uh, my family moved to Denver uh, when I started college, so my dad decided to sell our home, our only home. So he was at Denver, I was here, so I helped with that transaction. What he didn't know is that I was gonna keep his money. <laughs> so. Dad, I sold the home, but you know what? I need the money for the business. Can you, can I borrow it? But I had it, because I mean, they, pay, they pay me in Mexico, so he had no option. Now he would, he would do it anyway. Yeah. But it's still, it's a risk for him, and I really appreciate what, all the support, because um, this is a 25-year-old guy, I was, like, I was like 30, trying to do something, I mean. So what year did you start this business? What was that? What year did you start this business? I started in 2014. Okay. It's been nine years. Okay. And, and so um, you didn't have customers yet, but you knew no. what you wanted to do. Well, I, I mean, I, I knew the maquilas, I knew where they were, I knew some people. So you start um, uh, some, the maquila for us is pretty hard to get set up as a, right. as a, as a vendor. So I had all the time in the world because I didn't have kids. Then my wife was going to community college for bookkeeping, so I had a, had a free bookkeeper. Um, so she had to help me with that. So I was doing the rest. Um, what I started doing is I started hooking up with other suppliers that were already set up with that maquila, and I would go and do the sale and then sell through them. Okay. Sell through them and I started selling as well the invoices. There's a process where you sell invoices to like a factoring company. Okay, uh-huh. Like uh, many trans uh, logistic companies do that. Yes. 
So you go to, it's like a kind of a financial right. uh, institution. They buy your accounts receivable, so they paid you quicker while they wait for a fraction of them. Yeah, you sell your receivable, they pay you cash. Yes. For the pay up front, then when you get paid, mm -hmm. you pay them and you pay them a fee. Yes. So it was that, it was the partnership I was, I was making with other vendors that didn't know how to sell these or that product. Uh, and my credit card, my wife, and my, 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 my father's loan. Wow. So, so how long did it take you to get started and really begin to, for how long did it take you to get your first customer? Uh, it takes months. My first direct customer, it takes months, maybe three, four months. So you start working direct and getting a little bit more profit. But, you know, as I mentioned before, I was, I was healthy financially, no debt, no car payments, no credit cards, nothing like that. I always had salvage cars. I never felt I earned the right to a, to a dealership. I believe my first brand new car was when I was like 34. And I was doing decent money since I was working. Uh, but uh, no, I didn't feel right at that time. I didn't know I was going to start a business. Yeah. Interesting but about salvage cars. Salvage cars uh, don't have a guarantee. No, you don't. So but I, they sell them in what? Is it there? No, no, no. Uh, no, I did. Um, I went to Denver. Okay. And I bid on the cars. Oh, you, you would buy them? I would buy them like that. I'll crash and there's, there's, there's actions, there's people fighting for that. I didn't right. know how to do it, but I learned. <laughs> I took my wife, and uh, you see the cars, and then you, it's, it's funny. You bid on them. Yeah, bid on them, I bid on I remember when they, they give it to you like that, some of them are drivable, some of, their, some of them are not. But I remember driving back with a fender on my, on my, really? on my head, because it wasn't attached to it, so it was inside the car. Oh. It was no glass, so it was just a piece of, Gee. A bag smashing Pull, on my face. Pulling another car? Huh? One car alone or pulling another no, car? No, 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 just one car alone. No, that's some complex. Yeah. So I did, I did that a couple of times and we fixed them. They were pretty good cars. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I believe I still have one of those. Really? Yeah. So that, that if you start taking the first year and the second year for you and for you and for you, you're, gonna le you're not going to live much for the business or for the people that work for you. So. I didn't feel I earned it. I mean, I wanted to grow. The car is not part of that. It's just a means of transportation. I didn't care about salvage car, what color it was. I was focused on the business. I remember when I started, I didn't lose the routine. So my first day, I'm there, no customers, wake up at the same time, do my daily routine, dress with my uniform, and then just go to the next room, like if it was my job at 8 o'clock in the morning. Phone didn't ring, but I was there ready, calling customers. Wow, and, and so um, what was your f the first machine you sold? I believe it was microscopes. Yeah, a few of them. And, and, and they use them in production and quality control? Yes, they used them in the, in the production floor, yes. And, and then and you learned to factor, and, and so, so you started the sales process. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you were the salesperson. I was, yeah, it was everything, yeah. Me and my wife, and then I hired a, a first employee, which he was my friend, Oscar, after the first six months. And then we went, after one year, we moved to an office. And then we were making the deliveries on my salvage escape car. And it was just three of us. And then I, be, I have been keep adding one employee, maybe, or two every year. So right now we're like 20. 10 in the States and 10 in Mexico. You have offices in Mexico? Yes. How many offices do you have in Mexico? Um, five. It's um, Monterrey, Querétaro, Chihuahua, Juarez, and Nogales. So you've grown to 20 employees in nine years? In nine years. Zero rotation. Only so one guy has left the company in nine years. How, did, what, how, did, what have you done to keep the retention? Um, you know what, uh, we, we don't hire a number, we hire like a family member. So every time we hire somebody, we, the, the environment 
that we have is like a, like a small family. In your business? In my business. Not direct family, but when no, they no, come no. in, they become your family. In yes, no, not, not, yeah, only my okay. wife works there. Okay. Everybody is either people that we know from somewhere or uh, people that we, that we look for. But we do, we do many things together. For example, we have a cycling team. We have a cycling team there. Uh, everybody, you know, it's the, we, we, we put it together. We have our own jerseys and everything. Um, uh, I can show one to you. If yeah, I, yeah, you're, you're a cyclist. Uh, yeah, I'm a cyclist and my wife is a cyclist too. Everybody's a cyclist. Oh, quality supply, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's we neat. even designed them. We, there's a guy who designs it. It's yeah. a, one of our employees designs it. So Every year we come up with a new one. So that's your team. Yeah, or club. <laughs> so, so your family, your business uh, employees are part of the cycling. Yeah, too. all of them. Yes, yes. And uh, you know who the strongest rider is? My wife. Really? She beats me all the time. Well, yeah. Most of the time. <laughs> so you ride a lot. Yeah, we participate in races and everything. Yes. Wow, that's pretty neat. And the whole company. Yes, uh, but we we have one guy that's really into it, and he wakes up in the morning, at 4 a.m. every day, to train in the dark, and then he arrives wow. at the company early that's, than anybody else. That's fascinating. So, so is building this business then really satisfying what you wanted to do? Yes, totally. Yes, I, uh, we, uh, we, we, me and my wife, we like to help people a lot. So every time one of our teammates uh, is struggling with something, we just, we help them. We help them grow within the company, uh, professional and in their personal lives too. Why do you do that? It, I don't know. It's, it feels right. It, it's the, if we have good employees, we'll have a good relationship, a good teammate, and then we'll transmit that to the customer. So you really built a team, not only business team, but also a recycling team. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And um, and your customers see that? Yes, we even um, bump the customers at races and and, and um, we've met pe people that we know from the Maquila in the races on the, on the riding um, the clubs. That's great, it's better than golf, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Quality supply is a supplier of what? Supplier of um, industrial products. Proveedores. So we, we specialize in, in the quality control products. These are, these are machines and tools to measure the end product of the customer to see if it's within specs, if they can accept it or reject it. We also go out there and just, uh, if customer needs to source for a product that is outside of our of brands, we can also do that for them. So who are your customers? Well, customers is, um, you know, the automotive industry. It's medical plants, electronic plants, uh, airspace plants. We cover pretty much all the markets. It's mostly maquiladoras. So the manufacturing plants? Manufacturing. How big are you? How big? Um, not big enough. We're still growing. <laughs> but. Um, we sell maybe within seven to ten million dollars a year. Twenty employees, uh, four offices, five offices in Mexico and one in the States. Wow! And um, how old are you? In, I'm thirty-nine. In your business? Nine. Wow! That's fast growth. How did you? How did you handle fast growth? Oof! Um, to tell you the truth, I, I don't know. <laughs> I um, I never look at the numbers. Um, uh, it just you just gotta show up every day. I still show up every day, eight to five. Um, I'm just there for my teammates. Um, for an example, there's this uh, uh, teammate of us in Querétaro. She was frustrated because you couldn't sell one type of equipment that we didn't represent, and she comes back to me and tell me, "Hey, with I'm losing orders. Seven days after that, I'm talking to a, um, a manufacturer in Italy, and we're about to sign a contract to represent his product in Mexico and in the States. So, 
so she can have a better option next time. So um, how do we handle growth? I mean, you have to be passionate about it. You have to have a lot of discipline. And you gotta be financially healthy somehow. Doesn't mean that you have to have a lot of money, but you have to have a healthy um, spending. You, you're a trained accountant. Yes. You studied at UTEP, you got a degree in accounting. Yes, I did. And so you know the numbers. I know the numbers, but in the real world, it's different. Really? It, oh, much different. Yes, you, you, I mean, they teach you the theory, but when you're working, I mean, nobody, nobody's gonna tell you the customer is gonna pay late, and they're paying 120, 120 days. I mean, that's not in the books. So you gotta find your way. Wow, and your wife works with you? Yes, yes. And, and what does she do for you? Well, she's, she's, the, she's the accountant. We we're both accountants, so we really love, we understand the whole accounting thing. We loved it. So you know your numbers? I know my numbers, yes. And you control your cash flow? I think I do. <laughs> but you can't control your, when your customer pays you? Uh, I hope, I, no, I mean, it's not like they pay bad, but the terms that they... But these are big companies. Yes. Why do they pay so slow? Uh, I don't know, it's like, if you wanna work with them, it's gotta be their way. And? It's, it's, it's really uncommon to have a, a net 30 customer. Wow, that's a, that's a challenge for, for dealing with Maquila. Everybody that's a proveedor knows yeah. about that. But you grew up in the Maquila industry. Your father was an engineer yes. with the Maquilas? Yes, yes, he was a, he started from from the bottom. He's from he's from Durango. He he moved up the ladder, up to the ladder to management position. So I I knew my way around that, and some other family members too. But uh, uh, you think you understand it in some way, but when you're running a business, I mean, it's, it's so. What did you learn from your father? Oof, uh, my father. It's a um, it's a very independent, hardworking guy. Uh, let me tell you a story. When uh, when I was when I was a kid, we had this new TV, and my brother put a magnet to the TV. So there's this huge black stain in the middle, and then we were waiting for our dad to come from job from from work, and and then he looked at it, and then uh, so he went and, and gra grabbed the hair clipper where my mom used to cut her hair. He disassembled the plastic part and hold the electrical coil with a towel, and then he plugged it in. And then I was watching like The hair dryer? No, the, the clipper. The, the oh, the clipper, clipper, electric clippers. Yeah, the electrical clipper. And, and he started doing this in front of the TV, like some sort of magic. <laughs> and I was, he got in front of it, and then he walked backwards. Put it on the floor, because it was pretty hot, has no plastic on it. And then turn on the TV, grab a beer, watch soccer. Stain was gone. He knew how to demagnetize the TV. That's what he did. I mean, you don't learn that stuff in school. But my dad was always like that. There was no barrier. He never taught me that, but he set an example for us. You watched, you saw that. And that's one of many Situation. So, so did you have that entrepreneurial spirit then as a child, as a young person? Yes. Oh yeah. And that comes from my mom. Yes, I, I used to sell all types of stuff at school. Well, what did you learn from your mom then? Oh, she's, she's um, a caregiving. I mean, she dedicated the whole, whole life to us. She never worked, uh, but she had the hardest job in the world, raising four crazy boys. But uh, she, she's very social. So she's good at communication skills and the entrepreneur. It comes from my, my, my mom family. And, and, and it, she, she used to take us to, there's this little town in, in Chihuahua called Namiquipa, where I used to spend two, three months, all, every year we used to spend there. And we watched, you know, the farm side of, of living. My, my, grand, my grandparents have a little farm, I mean, they're not, it's a very humble farm, but uh, I remember um, picking up the eggs in the morning from the chicken, you know, 
and I, I, will, I will get very mad at my grandpa because he will not wait for me. Oh. And I will tell him every evening, don't pick up the eggs. Wait for me in the morning, but he will know. They wake up at 5 a.m. In, in, in the farms, and, uh, and, and that's the kind of childhood they provided to me. I was, I was very happy, and we were very united, and um, they never take a day off, my, oh. my, my parents, and they, always, they, are, they were and they are there for us all so the time. So you're just a worker. And, and yes. so, so you grew up in Juarez, mm -hmm. uh, and you come over to UTEP, mm -hmm. learned English at UTEP, you were sharing. Still learning. <laughs> and um, uh, you were saying your, your parents went to uh, Colorado? Yeah, they moved to Colorado, so they... Uh, from, from Juarez to Colorado, that's a big move. Why'd they move? Yeah, they had relatives over there. And I believe there was a lot of, a lot of work back then. But they had brothers and sisters living over there, so okay. they made the move. Yeah, I know it's a... And you stayed here? Had to stay here, because we were paying cash for the college, so Colorado, it's much wow. more expensive. Wow. So, so when you started your business, you just launched out and started your business. Yes. And uh, how in the world did you find your customers? Well, I, I, I knew some people. I had some experience. But um, I will just knock on doors just like everybody else. What were you selling them? I was selling anything, anything that they might need. Like? Anything that's not raw material. When you start, you gotta do whatever they need. Every, every maquiladora is different. So they might need different products. So you start learning to be um, multitask. Let's say an automotive company will need X materials and a medical will need a microscope. So you become very well known to find different types of products. So your product industry. lines now are what? Uh, our main product lines that we rep, it's uh, quality control tools and instruments like microscopes, video systems, gauges, uh, hand tools for measuring, measuring. But there is a second division of us who just helps the customer find to source any type of product they need. The customer, the maquiladoras, cannot buy anywhere they want. They have an approved list of vendors. So they got to buy from that. They cannot buy on the internet or Amazon or they don't have credit cards. So they have to pick from these and this list. They may ask you for one screw or they might ask you for a $100,000 machine from, from Europe. You name it. So we, we got to find a way to give to them the solution. So you went in and got on their vendor list? Yes. Little by little, I was getting like one or two maquilas every six months, which is not that much, but I was controlling my cash flow. So I had to, you know, that was keep pushing, keep That pushing. was intentional. What? Controlling your cash flow. Of course, you have to. I mean, it's they're paying 90 days, 120 days, and some products, see, when you start, uh, they don't give you a lot of representation on the on the um, on the on the supplier side. So the company had to be set up as a Texas LLC for them to trust you with the representation. Once you start getting uh, representation from your vendors, then you start getting more customers because you have a better price, a better service. And it's, but it's, it's little by little. So is that why you set up in El Paso? Yes. Yes, you have to. In order to represent important lines, you gotta be on this side of the border. And, and um, what, did you find challenges with that? Yes. So um, when you start, I mean, you wanna sell everything. And then uh, you gotta specialize in something, right? You never stop selling. Uh, what the customer wants, but you gotta specialize. So for them to start trusting you as a representation, that we have representation for, we're main vendors for the whole country of Mexico as exclusive vendors. So for them to trust you with that, you have a, you have a build, you have to have a, a good team for that to pick on you. So you, you, you start with basic products, and then you move up the ladder with more complex. Right now we're doing 3D scanning. 3D printing. Well, we started with hand tools. 
So you start moving and learning and you become bigger and better brands to represent. By the time you know you represent these 20, 30 lines and then customers are calling you. So you source for products that support the growth of your clients. Yes, as, as I told you before, I mean, each maquiladora, it's, it's different. And then we start moving to a different states and it's a different challenge, like Monterrey, Monterrey, it's, it's a tough one. Being in the border and going to Monterrey, so it, there's, there's very good vendors over there, but you gotta find your niche. So what I found is that in Mexico, the complex machines, um, many people are afraid of selling those because you know the service after selling the machine, you gotta train the customer, calibrate the machine, service the machine. So the niche that I found when I started, and I'm still trying to grow to a certain point, it's um, train your people and then go out and translate that knowledge to the Mexican culture, because it's different. You learn from the American people, the, the manufacturers, but the way of thinking in Mexico, it's much different. They don't want to know the whole many of options on the softwares. They have a different way of thinking and different way of producing. So do you have to train uh, the mindset? We have to train the mindset, yes. Yes, and I, that's one thing I enjoy. It's the trainings. I've been all over Mexico. I, they sent me to Chiapas, Sinaloa, customer that want me to go and train people over there. And it's, even though it's Mexico, it's South Mexico and they, they think different. So you're not only training them how to use the machine, you're training them how to think the machine to use it. Uh, yes, well, you have to train them, yes. They, 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 first of all, is the barrier that the, they think you might not know anything, that they're better, uh, because they've been in the industry, they're older people. And one barrier that I had, I was very young, I was 30 years old, 32, I was teaching engineers how to use X and Y machine, and the age barrier, I mean, it's, it's difficult even though it's my own people. You have to prove yourself as a person, as an, a professional. And I'm not that young anymore, but now I have to prove to the younger people that I know how to run the machines. So the niche, that need that we found, and people in Juarez, sometimes it's, they don't speak very well English as, as one's wishes. So they are afraid of these machines, these expensive machines, so what we do is we try to make it easier for them. Yeah. So what kind of challenges are you facing now? Well, now um, I know that what got me here is not going to get me there. So I need to change and create departments. So right now we're creating departments and a structure for my company to be more, um, we try to formalize the company. Uh, and there's no, there's no written law on how to do that, but we are, we're getting some professional training for the sales guys and professional training for the technicians. Um, getting into different states in Mexico, it's tough, because you're a, the, the outsider of the market. That's one challenge for sure, but I think we're doing great. So you, you've almost grown at a million dollars a year. Almost. So is your future growth uh, similar? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> um, we're, we don't focus in that, in the, in the sales What do you focus se? on? Building the team. Building the right team. Everything will come by itself. I don't, I don't really look at numbers. Maybe, I don't know, three, four times a year. I don't, I don't care about that. I just show up and keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Everybody's working, everybody's busy, everybody's happy. There's no complaints from customers, so everything should be okay. Wow, have you made mistakes? Yeah, of course, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Big ones? Big ones, big ones. I, ones, uh, they wanted this um, uh, refrigerator 
for the medical industry. Um, I believe we want to put some samples there and it has to be kept at a certain temperature. And well, we, you try to research, right, the most you can, but I didn't figure out that my industrial refrigerator, this is an expensive unit, and it was, there were two, it wouldn't go below the temperature that they needed. And it was already in Juarez, all unpacked. So you do make mistakes like that. So I have to go uh, put it back in the packaging. It's a huge refrigerator. Send it back and, and give it the correct one. And it's the expense and the, the uh, it comes from our pocket. I mean, it's not their fault. But yeah, you do a lot of mistakes. But you learn from them. Yes. Wow. Wow. So where do you want your company to be? Um, I would like to be the the metrology house for the Mexican market. Metrology, you call that? Metrology house. That wow. means a one-stop shop for your metrology solutions. Anything that you need to measure or inspect, you will be able to go to any of our offices around Mexico and try the product, really try them, and different products, uh, anywhere from scanning to a contact measurement to non-contact measurement harness testers, roughness testers, you name it. Um, but I will, like, I will have a technician, uh, a Mexican technician, prepare to explain you in your own language with patience. Um, and if the maquila moves from different state, we will have a, an office to provide service locally and fast. Wow. And so, but you're an accountant. How'd you get into such <laughs> technology? I don't know. I just um, I love I love the the um, helping customers. I love solving problems. I loved um, uh, finding and sourcing for new technology. We go to the shows, the best shows in manufacturing in the states. There's one called IMTS in Chicago. There's another one in Germany. And we go and source for new technology, and we bring that to the border. And customers in Mexico never seen such technology sometimes. Okay. So we try to learn it and translate it for them. And I don't mean from English to Spanish. I mean from the European way of thinking or the American way of thinking, how they think the system has to be used to the workers in Mexico. So, so you're saying that a piece of equipment, met, uh, metrology equipment, yes. has a mindset that designed it. Yes. And to use it right, you kind of have to understand that mindset, that conceptual framework. Well, what I mean is there's this, this, this complex machines with complex softwares, and there's a million buttons. So when we got the training, I mean, I've been to different places, and I got the training, it's a way, there's a way that the people that built it has, it has to be used one way. But when you go to the maquilas, you see customers are using it in a different way. But it works. It might be just using two button, buttons out of 100, but it works their way. So instead of us forcing them to try to use it the way the manual is written, we have to take into consideration their way of thinking. And maybe they're not able to write a program because it takes them forever. Uh, it takes anybody forever to learn those complicated softwares. So you find a way to make it semi-automatic or use it the manual way, but it will work for them. So you really are a, a mindset translator. I, th I think so. <laughs> that's, that's interesting in terms of, of, of the language of the equipment and, and the thought process of the user of the equipment. Now, don't get me wrong, there's people in Mexico, that they know how to run these these machines even better than us. Yeah. I mean, it's certain type of customers. Maybe it's their first unit, or they don't have the proper uh, technical background. Yeah. But there's other guys that are yeah. very, very well with the machines. But I know that you also help young people starting businesses. Well, yeah. Aside from that, we enjoy helping friends. And what do you what do you tell the people that are starting a business, what, what's your recommendation to them? I always tell them, I mean, you gotta be, you gotta have a passion for it. 
uh, self-discipline and don't take too much from the business when you start. I mean, earn it first. And me and my wife usually help them build the accounting part because most of people don't like the accounting part. And we help them, we give them some training and we'll, we'll help them to our extent. What do you wish you had known when you started that you've learned now? That oh my gosh. Uh, I wish I had more technical background maybe. Okay. Yes, because I was only. But now you hire that. Yeah, I hire that or, or I learn it. I usually am the first one who learns the machines because I really love that. And then uh, I passed it to my technicians. Yeah. We were also sharing that you're a, you're a cyclist. Yes. Uh, how often and how far do you ride? <laughs> um, I mean, um, we do about maybe 60 miles, 80 miles every Saturday. Um, there's a cycling club that starts at 5 a.m. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of my garage at 4.30, 4.40, all dark, riding to meet that club, then ride in 375. I know if you see us, you'll think we're crazy, but we're not. Um, there's like 30 guys. And then, so everybody have time to go to their jobs at 8 a.m. And uh, my wife, she, she used to be a runner, one of the best runners in Chihuahua when she was young. She was, I think, first place um, in Chihuahua in, their, in, in her age. For five years consecutive, she was doing first place runner, 5Ks and 10Ks. So now that she's doing cycling, I mean, she beats me all the time. And <laughs> everybody at the office enjoys cycling. It's our, our hobby. You have two, two young children. Yes, they're, they're good cyclists too. <laughs> How old are they? They're four and three. Wow. Isaac and Isai. Wow, that's interesting. And, and so, so you have a family and you do the cycling. What do you learn from cycling that helps you in business? Is there a relationship? Um, keep going, keep pushing. The guy, the guy behind you is gonna, is gonna take over. So it's the same, it's a competition. Everywhere is a competition. You gotta, you gotta keep pushing and, and if, if, if this guy is stronger than you, well, you, you make a team with him. There's nothing wrong with that. So have you hit a home run in your business or are you just getting base hits? What is it like? Uh, we, we get some home runs, yes. We've done some very large sales uh, for important companies. When a company is gonna open or expand to a new facility, they pick on a few vendors, the trustworthy ones. And I believe we have become one of the top three vendors in certain maquilas that when they open a new, a new facility, they only build with one or two because they're trustworthy. And I mean trustworthy, uh, the right equipment at the right time, and support after that. So we have reached that level with, with a few of them. It's very tough to be one of the top three. And for, for, for example, there was this company, you know how the logistic problem right now? We don't sell raw material. He was about to stop the line because didn't, his supplier didn't have the raw material. So they sourced out for another one, but they couldn't set him up because it takes forever. They called us, this is tons of tons of raw material coming from Asia. So we, we, we flew that. It was like $20,000 in air freight. The product maybe cost 10000 But we got a hold of them and we arranged all that. I mean, this is something that we don't do, but we did it for our customer. He, he trusted on us. We paid them up front. We didn't wait for terms or anything. So they do not stop the production line. We go as far as that to help our customers. So your focus is to develop a trust relationship. Correct. With your, with your client. Correct. That's the relationship is everything. And what is the root of that trust relationship? Um, you gotta be there for them in the good ones, in the bad ones. You don't get to pick which orders you want. 
You want to become the number one, be there for them. I mean, you still got your brands, right? You want to sell them this, do you remind them every day? Remember, I, I sell this, but they got this problem right now. You got to solve it first. You, you got to be there for them. Yes. Wow. Well, Mr. Quinones, it's wonderful to hear your, your great story of, there's much more to share about your, your business and your growth and, and the way you run that. Um, but I, I, I enjoy learning from an entrepreneur how in the world you built a business. It's fascinating. I trust our viewers have enjoyed uh, listening to you and your story. And your, your address is where? It's uh, 12370 Pine Spring Drive. It's just on the east side. And you're in a new building? Yes, we just recently um, built our new building uh, uh, last year. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, Mr. Quinones, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you for Appreciate having that. Me. And I thank you, viewers, for watching. And I uh, trust that you enjoyed this. We sure did. Thank you. Have a good day. Be blessed.